So um, I thank you for tuning in to um, listen to my, maybe it's perceived as some banter, some rambling on my part of my profession. Again, this is Work Thoughts. And today we're going to be talking about customer obsession. And if you are, uh, um, if you are in IT, you are a, a support person, you provide some kind of service, you're a business person that is um, engaged in providing services to your customers. You want to stick around. You want to stick around and, and listen to what I have to share today. Is All right, so it's based on experience and it's based on uh, context. And my context, it was my former workplace where this happened. And uh, it's based on context also in the sense that it's based in, in our part of the world. Sorry for a little background. So where the this is based on an article on work thoughts and work thoughts is my newsletter on linkedin if you're not subscribed yet please do subscribe and of course if you're not subscribed to my channel on youtube please uh subscribe as well so i went down to the banking hall and i was stuck there for about 45 minutes for about 45 minutes i had to just basically um wait around until it was my turn All right, so that was my daughter trying to um, get my attention. Um, I, I went to the banking hall and I, I had to stay there for about 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to share a few of my observations and some of the things I learned from there. I remember I said that I went to the banking hall as a staff of the bank, as someone responsible that used to be responsible for some aspects of the technology as someone that was responsible in part for the development of some te uh, technology. When I say responsible, of course, everything is collaborative. Nobody does anything by himself in such a large environment. But I had plots to play. I understood what was at play. I understood some of the systems that had to work properly for these uh, tellers to serve the customers and keep the population in the banking hall as little as possible. So I was there for 45 minutes, thereabouts. I timed myself because I began to think about that. What I observed, first of all, was that uh, obviously there was a queuing system. So you had to go to, like any other bank, go to the queue, go to the, um, the, the, the machine, you know, um, pick a ticket, depending on what you wanted to do in the banking hall, and wait for your turn. You probably had some estimated time of estimated turnaround time, you had a number and all that. So I just was looking around, looking at all the people that were seated. I think there were a few, few people standing, right? Just basically waiting for their turn. Once in a while, the uh, speaker would come up with a voice prompt stating that the next number should go to teller number XXX and all that. So um, questions, you know, began to flow in my mind. First of all, why did we have to wait this long to get service in the banking hall? Someone argues that if you could make everyone use the digital channels, there wouldn't be so many people in, in the banking hall, which is quite true. And that will bring me to another conversation around what I call um, the technology acceptance model. When you as a bank have decided that in this territory, we are going to deliver service digitally. And you make an assumption that because we are delivering services digitally, the volume of customers in our banking halls will drop. That is a fair assumption. Then you now take the next action that says, because we feel or we expect the number of customers in our banking halls to drop, we're going to reduce 
the footprint of brick and mortar in our, as a bank that becomes a uh, a strategic direction to say look we know that digital will cut down the number of um, customers that have to come to the banking hall therefore we are going to cut down the number of banks or um, banking halls we operate we are going to cut down the number of staff it's we are now taking a, a decision, a, a, a strategic position that says we want to be more digital. That is brilliant. That is beautiful. But the, the, the challenge there is metrics. Measuring your theory of change. Your theory of change says that once I provide more digital channels, more customers will prefer to use the digital channels because it is more convenient. So we will have fewer people in the banking halls and we will not need as many banking halls. We will not need as many tellers. We will cut costs on brick and mortar. We will cut costs on staff. Brilliant. It sounds good. That is a theory of change. But in practice, you now have to measure it in phases. You have to measure it at intervals and say, okay, now that we have deployed our data channels, what is the level of adoption of our data channels? What is responsible for this level of adoption? Is it aligning with our projected level of adoption according to our theory of change? Is it aligning? If it is aligning, if it is not aligning, what can we do to accelerate the rate of adoption, what are the factors responsible for uh, this rate of adoption and how can we influence them? Now, when you take that metric, adoption rate, right, you begin to analyze it, it will tell you whether you need to go to the next level in implementing your theory of change. That next level being cut down banking halls, cuts down tellers so that your change is, 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 is there's a reality now backing your theory because if you cannot measure it, it it's probably not uh, you can't really say you are successful in implementing that transformation because what you're doing is digital transformation and when you're doing digital transformation the factors the, the dimensions must come into play the technology, you have it, you have control over it. You've deployed the digital channels. There's the people part. The people part is in mainly two aspects. The customers that you are trying to digitalize, who must accept your new uh, technology, according to certain theories, one of which is the technology acceptance model. The second is the process. Do they find using the technology easier? Is it well-known procedure? Does it work? compared to walking into the banking hall. Then there's so many other variants of this, of this, of the, of the, uh, of how the theory eventually plays out. For example, culture. Would people prefer to come to the banking hall so that they can meet people, have a chat with tellers, compared to typing something on their phones or on, on, on the internet? So those are questions you have to answer on all three dimensions, people, process, technology, before you um, conclude that your theory of change, which is that digital channels will reduce the need for brick and mortar before it actually works. And you see, you, you, want, to, you want to evaluate this in context because it could very well work for a Europe, but maybe it doesn't work for an Africa. It could work very well for Sweden. Perfect internet connectivity. Digital channels are perfect. People are more solitary than communal communities in Africa. I mean, there, there are variables that could make it work better in certain environments compared to where you are. So evaluating that theory of change with the reality that unfolds is important to determine, yes, we saw this work somewhere. Let's test it to see whether it works here. Phase the transformation, measure the progress, define metrics specifically, and then determine 
Is it happening like we thought it would happen? So these are the variables at play in this context. We now see that the banking halls are fewer. The population in the banking halls has not dropped as dramatically as we thought. And in some cases, the technology is not working as beautifully, as seamlessly as we thought, right? So that was what I was seeing. I was now seeing a lot of people sitting for 45 minutes in a banking hall. And then somebody's asking, but we have digital channels. We can do this on this, this, and that. Maybe they don't know. It could be that they don't know. So that's another aspect of the people dimension. The stakeholder engagement, the education, the marketing. But it could also be they have tried it and it's not working for them. So that becomes the technology acceptance model problem. Perceived ease of use and perceived usefulness. Do I, as a customer, consider this product good enough to use? Right? Is it, is it working for me? Is it doing what I expect it to do? And is it, can I really use it? Am I educated enough? Uh, do I find the interface appealing enough? Many questions they have to answer. And sometimes in order to find the answers to these questions, um, banks or companies that adopt digital platforms want to do surveys. Now, if you do a survey, there are a few things that will happen. Some, some people respond to surveys somewhere in their hearts as Africans. They don't want to offend you. They don't want to make somebody lose their job. So they write boxes and say, yes, yeah. oh, it's wonderful, it's awesome, it's good. Or you see, you may want to find out more information about the perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use by observing the customer using the product. And you as a technical person, maybe you, you want where you even sit with somebody using your app or using your web browser and you watch them and you discover that they are finding it difficult to do simple things. And you, for you, it is intuitive because you have a technology background. You're working for the bank. You know what's up, right? For them, it's not intuitive. And then you now step back and ask yourself, why is this not intuitive? for this person. What is wrong with my design? What is wrong with the process? What is wrong with the interface? What is wrong with the way the app works that makes it unintuitive for the typical user to be excited about this um, digital platform that are rolled out? Very important. So in my observation, I went further to now um, basically when it was my turn, that is when it got to where I could observe from the perspective of the teller, why is this queue so long in the banking hall? What's happening? Is it not fast enough? Is the, is the banking, core banking platform not fast enough? Because then they're already in the banking hall. I can't ask about mobile banking. I can't ask about internet banking. They're already there. There's a reason they've come there. There's something that they are not seeing the way we saw it in terms of how the digital platforms uh, worked. Maybe there's a functionality they couldn't use properly there. Maybe they didn't feel it was used. Maybe they were not educated enough about the platforms, but they're already in the banking hall. So the next question was, why did they have to spend so long? Is it because we had cut down the number of banking halls, number of staff, and we were now experiencing a natural uh, traffic of, of, of customers in the existing banking halls? Or is it because there's something else wrong with even the systems that the tellers were using? So I struck a conversation with one of the tellers and began to ask about it. And one of the, some aspect of our response indicated that um, there was something about the system that was a bit slow. So it impacted the rate at which they could um, deliver on, on, on their service. So there's, a, there's a, um, a, a thought leader called JJ Sly. I think he, he did mention it that um, small talk is important for banks. 
being able to extract information from potential customers uh, based on interaction with them rather than based on things like surveys. Now, if I had, this was a staff I was now speaking to. If we had sent out a survey to tell us, to ask them for their feedback, first of all, we may even have a problem with what question to ask, right? What question will we be asking? First of all, if, you, if that survey is being um, constructed or designed by IT, somebody in the IT team may even be hesitant about asking any question that will indicate that we had failed. <laughs> nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to have that indication that somebody has failed you know, in delivering the product. So the questions were, are probably going to have a political um, tint you know, about it. So um, you may not get the right information from the tellers. But in having a conversation that no strings attached, you don't even know the name of the teller, you can't report that teller told me this, then um, you may get more information. And I did get a, a little more information. And then another thought struck me. If this has been happening, why is the teller not reporting it through uh, typical channels? The, there's an IT service management platform where you could log tickets and say this is happening. So that exposed something else. It's possible that this our process of reporting issues was not working. The, the process by which we were even collecting um, incident records was not resulting in the kind of value that will actually um, transform the experience of the customer, customer experience, right? So it was good in terms of we had, a, we had records of tickets, people were trying to log stuff. Mm, IT guys were resolving tickets and we're happy about it. We we're reporting good metrics in terms of service management, but it did not transform the experience of the customer in the banking hall. People still had to wait 40 minutes to get attended to. So, yeah, so it's a case of the digital is deployed on three fronts. One front, mobile and online platforms. Second front, core banking system, digitalized. Third front, ticket management system, digitalized. But the experience of the customer had not been transformed. So there was a lot of focus on the technology dimension that needed to spread out a little more to the people dimension in terms of the staff, employees, training, education, ETC, and the process dimension, which had to align better to make sure that the, the, the flow is seamless and the technology delivers real value in all these transformation initiatives. Yeah, so that's that. Then um, a, a lot of stuff going on there, right? One of the things that came to my mind in that experience was maybe we could create a feedback flow. I, I, I did a drawing of this in the article on LinkedIn. So if you want to take a look at it, work thoughts on my profile, where I began to think through, what if we had another kind of feedback loop instead of depending solely on our digital um, service, IT service management platform? We could have a feedback loop that had people talking more. Those... Um, um, what do you call them? Sprints, those meetings among the team that would the leader would ask the tellers, what, what did you experience today? What was it like? He takes that feedback back to IT through business partners or whatever else you may want to call them. And they're able to give more attention to the actual experience of the tellers, which reflects the actual experience of the customers in the banking hall. And this, if, you, if you, we are honest about such an evaluation, it could teach us a lot. It could teach us, for example, something about why our external customers are not embracing technology platforms as we thought they would in our theory of change. It could teach us about how our core banking platform is really working. It could teach us about how our service management platform is really working how it's translating to value and improving the experience of the customer, right? So I, there, that feedback loop 
uh, it, that is based on small talk, not based on forms, not based on surveys, not based on digital platforms that we think should be working, which are not working this, the way we thought they should be working. So in, in, in taking up this, this, this um, method, we are combining two things, conversation and observation. And I would like to give an example of a certain um, laundry company who did this. The story has it that they, they sent their people out to observe how housewives were using their product and to learn a little bit more about what they can really do to improve the product. So what they did was they started watching housewives doing laundry. And they observed that when the housewife finishes the laundry, um, hangs the clothes out on the line, uh, and comes back later to pick the clothes up, they would pick the cloth clothing up and then they will sniff. They wanted to enjoy the fragrance of that piece of clothing. And the message there to the laundry company was that they could improve sales by simply improving the quality, the quantity, the, 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 you know, the intensity of the fragrance they were using, right? Something as simple as that. You see, you could not have even constructed a, a survey question that would lead to something like that. You had to observe it. You had to see the customer using the product. The, the customer intuitively or, or by some kind of, um, um, what do you call it again? It's, it's just a natural behavior. It's, it's like instinct. It's like, it's like uh, uh, something unplanned. You just decide, I want to see, I want to, I want to know how this smells. And it communicates to you somewhere in, the, in your psyche that the, cloth, the clothing has been properly um, cleaned. So they observed this and they were able to erase their sales by simply um, improving the fragrance. Right, so I, I earlier mentioned that technology ad adoption model in the context of the digital, digitalized or digitalizing bank. And it's very important to, to take that into context. Are we, is our theory of change working based on something we cannot control, which is the customer's behavior? If we are obsessed about the customer, then we must observe how the customer is using our product, whether we are IT people delivering service or business owners, you know, offering us a, a, a product. I mean, there's, there's a technique that uh, IBM markets a lot for this, which is design thinking. And some organizations have used this technique to involve external customers in the development of their products. And, it, and the, the, the results are just fantastic. You may want to check that out. I'll just put a link somewhere in this video where they actually involve representative members of the community or potential customers to come and say, we want to change the way this product works. Come and share your views on it. Come and use the prototypes and let's watch you using it um, and, and see what we can do to improve. That's design thinking. So uh, you can demonstrate as an organization customer obsession by getting deeper in your relationship with the customer through observation and conversation. By taking into account three dimensions that are associated with digital transformation, people, process, technology. By being uh, genuine, authentic about your uh, the way you um, rate yourself, measure your success in terms of digital transformation, in terms of the launch of digital products. So let me stop there for today. Um, I hope you liked this. I hope it makes sense to you. I would like to get your comments. I would like to get your um, feedback. And I would like to I want you to think through it with me. If you're in that space, if you're in the technology space, if you're offering a product as a business owner, think through it with me and, I, and, and ask yourself, maybe you, you share your experience in the content, in, in the comments rather, share experience in the comments and, and tell us, how do you think you may want to observe the customer? What are you measuring in terms of your improvement journey 
as a, a, a service provider? What are you measuring? Um, is your transformation working? Is your digital transformation effort working? Or do you need to refine it? Do you need to step back and say, our theory of change has some flaws we need to address so that you really get the value you, you, you want? Thank you very much. My name is Kenneth Igiri. Subscribe to Work Thoughts. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Stay in touch and keep improving your day.